Welcome back to Mortuary Mayhem, a podcast by funeral service professionals for funeral service professionals, where any day above ground is a good one. Joining us today, we have Emma Wah, the Public Health Program Coordinator for the United South and Eastern Tribes. How have you been? Been good. It's been a little busy, and but overall good. I imagine your flight back from the training you did up here was uneventful. Yeah, no, no issues there. Oh, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a really good thing. Especially in this day and age. Yeah. Have you been doing? Do you guys do that training a lot, or you travel around a lot for that, or? Um, it's funny. We like don't do it that frequently, but then when we were up in Massachusetts, we did it twice. And then I was in Nashville like a week and a half later to do it there. Um, but now like we don't have any others scheduled right now. Um, but potentially, uh, going to Alabama to do it in May. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. That was a great, that was a great training. So yeah, thank you. Thank I know you. we all appreciated you. So glad. Appreciated you guys coming up. So no, that was, that was great that you were able to yeah. do that. All right. Um, maybe to start, maybe we can tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and maybe a little bit about you set. Yeah, definitely. Um, my name is Emma Waugh, um, and I work in public health for the United South and Eastern tribes. Um, so we are what's called a tribal epidemiology center. Uh, so similar to how, you know, a state or a city has a department of health, uh, we provide somewhat similar services to Uh, 33 member tribal nations that are part of our organization. Um, We serve tribal nations that uh, span the northeastern woodlands uh, down to the Everglades and across the Gulf of Mexico. So it's a really big geographic region. Um, I also also always also always like to start by um, letting everyone know that myself, uh, I am not native, uh, but I have had the honor and privilege of working with tribal nation communities for the past four and a half years now. Uh, And I would just like also to acknowledge uh, where I'm coming from today. I'm recording from uh, here in Atlanta, Georgia, which is the uh, traditional homelands of the Muscogee or Creek peoples. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. This has been amazing. Um, And, you know, again, I found out through, you know, about you rather, uh, because you did an amazing training uh, for us up in Massachusetts, which was greatly appreciated. Um, And I know something that you uh, hope to hopefully get into more and more places and get this message out. Uh, I mean, what else can you share? I mean, I know you have a a big agenda and uh, you had some great messages. Yeah, so I thought I would kind of start by start off by talking about what the big deal is with death certificate demographic sections. Um, When you hear demographics, you're not, you know, thinking like, oh my gosh, this is the most exciting or interesting thing ever. It's usually in all contexts, not just death certificates, something you kind of uh, just kind of fill out and move on and move forward with. But what I'm here to talk about today, racial misclassification. and the death certificate demographic demographic portion and how we use it in public health. Um, so, uh, what I wanted to start with is by defining what racial racial misclassification is. Uh, so it sounds uh, it is kind of like what it sounds like. It occurs when the race that an individual identifies with is incorrectly recorded as a different race on health records. Um, on, in this case, death certificates. It can also happen on legal records. Basically, anywhere where we are collecting um, race and ethnicity data, you can have uh, racial misclassification. That's incredible. Um, How much misclassification do we get? I think a lot of funeral directors are completing the death certificate and we're getting information from the family. So whatever they say is what goes. And I know we're limited by what that death certificate may have as options. And I know that's mm-hmm. something that you've addressed in the, uh, when I spoke with you last. How much misidentification are we actually seeing? Yeah. So before I get to that question, I just want to explain how we understand, how we know that this problem exists and how we you know, get to the answer to that question. And that's through what we call a data matching process. So there are epidemiologists at my organization uh, people at the CDC that do this, state uh, health departments in some, so to some regards, do this as well. And essentially what they do is they take uh, the death certificate data that um, comes from death certificates, comes from an Office of Vital Statistics, and they have a uh, 
a second data set that they're going to match it against. So in our case, that can often come from Indian Health Service medical records, um, but it could also come from uh, other data sources that participants have participated in and gave their racial information throughout their lifetimes through tribal enrollment records. There's a lot of different sources where people, you know, when they're alive, they identify. And uh, these epidemiologists will do what's called a match. And so they'll look in one data set, they'll say, is the name of this individual the same as the name over here? Is the birth date the same? We know they're the same individual. And then see yes or no, is the, that race and ethnicity field the same in both data sets? So that's what we call uh, data matching. So there's been a lot of different studies in a lot of different contexts that have have done this. And for the Native American population specifically, um, estimates range from, you know, 20 percent of decedents are misclassified all the way up to 40, 45 percent of decedents that are misclassified. So that's quite a significant chunk when you almost have one in two uh, people of uh, Native American people who are being misidentified. Um, we can dig a little further into the data. There are certain trends that have come about uh, from these researchers that do these matching projects in a lot of different contexts. Um, so one of the things that people have done for the Native American population specifically is looked at different regions in the country to see where it most often occurs. And what we're seeing is that racial misclassification tends to be higher in the eastern region. Um, it tends to be higher in urban areas compared to rural areas, uh, and it tends to be higher uh, in counties and in jurisdictions that are further away from tribal lands or from, from reservations. Uh, so if you look, uh, I'll take for the East Coast, for example, you know, there are reservations and tribal homelands all across the East Coast. They're maybe a little bit smaller than some of the reservations out West, but um, in the context in the East, uh, one study found that racial um, misclassification hovered around 20% when you're near uh, tribal lands. And then when you go away from tribal lands, that number almost doubles up to, to 40%. Uh, and this in particular is really alarming to us because we know that um, the Native American population, uh, I think it's 78% of the Native American population does not live on reservation lands. So the vast majority of this population is not living in these tribal homelands as living in these areas um, where racial misclassification is, is more common. Where do we see, I know that's where the problem lies, but how do we, is there a way that we can fix it? I mean, is this something where the funeral director may be looking across the table and giving less options? Are they narrowing those options down because they have less time and obviously yeah. they're trying to get to the point with the family? Or is this something that maybe we're not, in, we're not provided the information um, that we're informed? Like, how how yeah. do we fix this? Yeah. 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 Um, there's, there's a lot of different answers there. I think every one of the things you said is probably a very valid reason why some of this racial misclassification happens. Uh, so there are other people that have done studies. They've done um, you know national surveys with funeral directors. They've done qualitative interviews with Native and non-Native funeral directors. Ourselves have done a little bit of outreach to funeral directors to talk about why uh, this might happen. Um, one of the biggest reasons that comes up a lot is if a funeral director in the case of the death certificate or say a medical staff, a nurse or whoever it is, uh, just guesses what the race of a person is. Um, this is also really um, documented among the Hispanic and Latino population. And there's been those matching studies that I talked about where if um, somebody has a Spanish last name and they identify as Hispanic or Latino, they're much more likely to be classified as Hispanic or Latino as opposed to somebody who maybe presents as what you might think of as a white uh, white presenting, um, but and doesn't have that Spanish last name, they'll be misclassified. Um, we do recognize, you know, within uh, the funeral home and other contexts, there's a lot of different things that that are uh, that happen that are really important. And again, death certificate demographics, demographics in general are not something you're, you know, keen to, to spend a lot of time on. Um, and so one of the things we'll, I hope we'll, we'll get into today is why it's so important and that by uh, expressing that to, to people that it could increase um, the likelihood of getting correct information. 
Um, what you mentioned as well, where forms do not have, you know, American Indian or Alaska Native as a box. Um, on all death certificates in the United States, they will have that box. But if a funeral director is copying information, say, from a medical face sheet or from some other source coming from a medical institution, uh, those those race category boxes are not, uh, not often standardized. And it's um, quite common also for people only to be able to select one race. Um, and that is alarming for us in our work because Native Americans are among the most uh, racially and ethnically diverse group in the country. So many of these individuals will have two, three, four racial and ethnic identities. And that just, you know, increases the opportunity for that information to be lost at a certain point. Um, and then you also bring up a really good point of how as funeral directors, you are limited to the information that somebody is giving to you. Um, and it is quite possible that the family or the uh, decedent may not have been very uh, forthcoming and does, they don't want to disclose their status as American Indian or Alaska Native for fear of racism. Um, and that is, you know, a very real fear that individuals, particularly older individuals uh, have, but also continues to this day. And so I think, you know, funeral directors, you know, listening to this podcast, taking our training and the more they can understand about the Native American population and about the Native American population in their region and the tribe uh, that they're they're particularly dealing with, the more likely it is that the person will be comfortable disclosing that information. Okay. I have immediate family in both New Mexico and Alaska, actually. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I travel out to visit them, the native population is a lot more maybe visual. Uh, mm -hmm. You see it because there's the yeah. reservations. You drive by, there's a sign for the reservation. You yeah. go to Old Town. I mean, it's I, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. They're out on their blankets. They're selling their wares. It's authentic. Uh, and you get that sense of like who they are as a culture. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, being here in the Northeast, they're everywhere. They're around us, but we don't see it as maybe as visually uh, mm -hmm. in our community. Do we see that those areas where it's maybe a more visual um, part of the culture and of the community that we see more or less uh, misclassification compared to areas where maybe it's more of a melting pot and maybe, uh, you know, I'm going to use the word assume. <laughs> maybe yeah. you're just, you, you're, 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 your choices are narrowed down because you're not, oh, you came from, you know, Taos. Oh, okay. I know, you know, that's down the street. Yeah. That's the reservation. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. In those studies where I was talking about with data matching, I mentioned the East Coast is the region where the most racial misclassification happens. Um, looking up in Alaska, um, it's not perfect, but racial misclassification in that study was, you know, hovered somewhere between 90 and 95 percent of accurate classification. Um, I think people do tend to associate uh, Native Americans in Oklahoma and with the Southwest. Um, but, you know, there are 574 federally recognized tribal nations uh, in states all across the, the country. Um, we, in our organization, we have 33 member tribal nations um, that uh, are within um, 13, 13 East, Eastern and Southern states. So yeah, you're right. They are um, they are there. The other thing I, I do want to point out, I mentioned before that nearly 80% of Native Americans do not live on reservation lands, but live in urban, rural, and suburban communities very far away from their tribal homeland. So uh, New York is actually has the largest population of urban natives. So that's a East Coast city. Um, Washington, D.C. is also up there. Uh, and I did look up right before this um, within this statistic is a little dated, but in Boston, there are 27,000 um, people who had identified as uh, American Indian or Alaska Native. So it is a significant uh, chunk of the population. Um, there are the federally recognized populations that I've primarily been talking about because that is um, the group that my organization serves. Um, uh, there are also uh, state recognized populations. So for one reason or another, um, there are groups that have existed um, since time in memoriam in this country in on this land um, that are not recognized by the federal government, but maintain, you know, familial, cultural and identities with with um, uh, tribal groups. And then there are self-identified populations, which maybe fall more into the category you were talking about in some instances um, of people who may learn about uh, Native American descendancy uh, later in life or they're just may they they're. Um, 
tribal nation or their group just may no longer exist because there are um, so few members left. Uh, the other thing I do want to point out is that uh, tribal nations exist as sovereign entities. So they operate as essentially countries within countries. And this is something that uh, I think some people do find quite surprising and is really uh, interesting and something I'm continuing to learn about every day. Um, Tribal nations operate uh, police forces, they operate schools, housing authorities, public health authorities um, to, to run their own country and being able to to identify their population and have data on their population is a right that comes with being a sovereign entity, just like the United States has the census and other data sources that provide information to the federal and state governments on, on what their population is. Okay. You know, and I know as I do, you have a MPH as well. And so just (laughs) your, your entire team. So coming from, we're all coming from a public health side Mm -hmm. of things. So I'm sure that a lot of this has to do with, funding as well. So if we're not classifying things correctly, we're denying a whole population uh, the funding that they need to get, as you said, they're their own state, they're their own country within the country. Yeah. So if we don't get them the funding, we're denying them health care, public health, resources, anything that they would otherwise be entitled to us, essentially going maybe to someone else that's Getting that checkbox is maybe exactly. where we're going. Okay, exactly. That's such an important point to bring up. Um, and one thing I do want to to talk about. So, if you let's think about um, the top ten causes of death in the United States. You know, there's heart disease, cancers, uh, diabetes. There's all of these conditions. Uh, there's no one place as public health professionals where we can go and say, "Let me see a- absolutely everybody." who was afflicted with heart disease or was afflicted with this one type of cancer with the exception of mortality data because every single death gets recorded. And that's why it's such a powerful source of information because it is such a complete data set. Um, And like you said, as public health professionals, we are constantly having to make decisions, but not only us, um, our federal, our state governments, tribal nation governments have to decide what it is they want to do to to promote and provide the best possible health they can for their populations. And so when the information is not recorded correctly, it creates this distorted picture of morbidity and mortality. And so we, you know, may think or leaders may think like this is what is happening. This is where our money should go. And it's always limited funding. Um, and it's it's not because we don't have full understanding of the picture. And you really don't have to think back much further to the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, think back to when vaccines were only being offered to such a small percentage of the population. Um, treatment was only being there was, it was not available and it was a really acute situation and leaders had to decide where to send these very limited resources and they were doing it, you know, kind of half blind, which is a problem not only for the communities and the populations that get erased from the data, but it prolonged the pandemic for all of us. Absolutely. Now that makes complete sense. Now, across the country, I know we have funeral homes typically set themselves with a demographic. Um, You have Mm -hmm. funeral homes that cater to a certain religion, Mm -hmm. a certain culture, a certain demographic. Um, In some cases, you know, we have some funeral homes that just do veterans, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, something we don't think about. Uh, You know, I'm sure that there's someone out there, but is this a common thing? I know I'm not familiar with any in my area. Is there any funeral homes out there that provide services that is strictly the native population where they're able to best serve those with the um, traditions that they're used to? Yeah. um, I can say there are certain tribal nations in our region that work not exclusively, but work uh, pretty extensively with one or two funeral homes that are near their reservations or near their tribal homelands. Um, But again, I would come back to this point of many, many Native Americans for a whole host of reasons that have uh, spilled out over the last uh, since colonization do not live near their original or current homelands. And in those instances, you know, they eventually would be needing funeral service, funeral services from whoever is is near them. Um, Another thing that I I wanted to mention 
is a lot of tribal nations do offer tribal burial assistance for their citizens or for their descendants. Um, but these vary widely from tribe to tribe and including the amount um, and including what uh, services are offered and provided. Um, and I think that is maybe part of the reason certain tribal nations go with one or two funeral homes because they're very familiar with their tribal burial programs, their tribal burial practices, and are, have, you know, built up trust with that community to, to offer that service for them. Now, what can we do in addition to, you know, properly classifying people and making sure that this is part of our worksheets when we're meeting with families, you know, actually making sure that our worksheets include that as an option because I can see them. Sure, there's yeah. many out there that may have <laughs> omitted that they went with what their demographic usually serves. As I said, most funeral homes have a specific demographic, and uh, we may not be thinking outside that. But how do we better serve this population with, you know, even their traditions? Are there traditions that we can provide um, as part of our funeral home? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, on the on the data side of it first, exactly what you said. If you use a worksheet, double check it. Make sure American Indian Alaska Native is on there. Make sure it's very clear. You can collect more than you can check more than one box. Um, whenever possible, collect the information yourself. Do not rely on information from from other sources. Um, also specific to to the data side and to Native Americans, um, uh, if somebody does does check the American Indian Alaska Native box, always be sure to fill in the, their tribal nation affiliation. It's perfectly acceptable to ask um, for the tribal nation affiliation. It's perfectly acceptable to ask how to spell it, because um, that can be quite tricky, um, and also to ask and to write down the federally recognized name of the tribal nation if that applies. Um, so those are all things on the data side that can be done uh, on the other side, I will <laughs> come back to this again. There are those 574 federally recognized tribal nations, dozens more state uh, popula state recognized populations and the self-identified populations, and they are all distinct. They are all diverse. If you were in Europe and you were working with somebody who was from Finland and you were working with someone who was from Spain, their burial practices would be completely different. Um, but what you can do is learn about the tribal nations in your state, in your area, um, uh, reach out. There are urban, uh, urban native health centers in, um, there's definitely one in Boston. There's one in Baltimore. There's some all over the, um, different, different, uh, metropolitan areas across the country. Um, do, do, do some education. So if it does, you know, they do come across you, you have some understanding and you're not, you know, in addition to trying to get this information, um, uh, you have some background already and you can start from a different place than if you hadn't. Uh, I will also say if, um, there are, uh, tribal nations in your area or, you know, in your state, looking, most of them have websites, Facebook pages, look at their uh, cultural preservation offices, many of them have it, or historical uh, departments, those types of things. That is like, that is what they do is they provide information and share it about their tribe. So that would be a good place to learn about, um, about all aspects of the tribe. Um, and if you ever have the opportunity to, uh, attend an event that they're hosting, a talk by a Native American speaker, um, powwows, that is like, these are all excellent, excellent places to learn about some of the, uh, these populations. Yeah, and I, I'm just thinking, too, as a funeral director, how great it would be to be able to reach out to those, you know, the local reservation or tribe and, uh, you know, invite them in and say, like, hey, can you use, you know, if you come to our venue, maybe you can train my my staff. Yeah. And as an educator, I'm like, hey, now, now I'm starting to think, like, hey, maybe <laughs> maybe I can invite all the local people and then get the funeral directors to come and, mm -hmm. you know, have them do, yeah. as you said, like a powwow, have them, uh, yeah. you yeah. know, kind of sh demonstrate, maybe do a live demonstration. So you're like, wow, that's, Different. I want that. I want to be yeah. the funeral home that offers that. And that's, <laughs> I see a niche happening here. I see something, a funeral home that can sell that as a, as a service. Because, I mean, I, yeah. I know the funeral homes that I worked at, I mean, same thing. We serviced you know, very specific, maybe one or two religions that came to us primarily. And we then serviced uh, maybe two or three others that I'm not going to say we bit, did the best job. Um, I think we did a phenomenal job. I think we did it for uh, the religions that we were personally, for the people we normally mm -hmm. served. But at the end of the day, I felt like I was providing a 
service to these other religions based off of my own uh, my own practices, maybe, or how, you know, as a different type of funeral home, I was providing them our version of that, you know, yeah, versus yeah. if they had just gone to a specialty funeral home, you mm-hmm. know, I could see where there there would be massive differences. So yeah. um, um, one other point I wanted to make that uh, I thought of while you were saying that um, many tribal nations also have museums and cultural centers that are open to the public. And that would be an excellent place to go um, uh, to learn about the history and uh, the the place that is like very appropriate for, for some of that learning. Wow. That would be an awesome opp- opportunity um, yeah. to get everyone involved in that. All right. Anything else we should know? What else should we know about? Yeah. Um, um, one other thing I did did want to touch on in terms of the the data side of things and when collecting the information, something that has come up um, in some of the research that's been done um, is when you do find you are working with a family that is Native American, uh, you should not be asking for proof of that racial identity. Uh, Native American populations, uh, if they're part of a federal or state recognized tribe, may have some sort of tribal enrollment card or certificate of Indian blood is what it's called. Um, But those are for proof that they are associated with that sovereign entity as a citizen. That is not proof of being Native American. Um, So if uh, you know, it wouldn't be appropriate to ask anyone else in any other different race category to prove that they are of that race. So similarly, that's not something that you would want to do with this population. Another point, um, you will will have heard me throughout kind of switch between the terms Native American and American Indian Alaska Native. Uh, so American Indian Alaska Native is a legal term, which is set by the Office of Management and Budget um, that goes across all your government forms. So that's why on death certificates, you'll see American Indian Alaska Native. Uh, Native American and American Indian Alaska Native do both tend to cover the same group, the same population of people. Uh, Our organization and I myself tend to use the term Native American. Um, However, there are a lot of different preferences. Uh, One of the best practices I try to do when I'm working with someone is if someone refers to themselves in a certain way, I'll I'll mirror that language back to them. Um, But that's, I know, a, a, a confusing point that people often have there. And there is like a fine, fine distinction that does is worth some explanation. Now, as far as how people classify themselves, is that is there like a difference in maybe locality, like or are there certain tribes, you know, tend to use certain terms maybe more than others or? Yeah, I couldn't speak to like geographic, like where there is, but I do think kind of anecdotally, there is some differences in kind of where people would refer to American Indian versus Native American versus indigenous is another one that you hear. It's a little less common in the US, more common um, internationally. Uh, It's also a a bit of a generational thing as well, you know, kind of as in, you know, everything else, language kind of changes over time. So you may hear um, some older folks referring to themselves as Indian or American Indian versus maybe more younger folks with Native American. Uh, But that is all very, very anecdotal. And just a little bit in my experience, it really, really is uh, an individual preference and an individual uh, uh, choice there. And I know during the seminar that you uh, that you provide, your colleague had mentioned, you know, how her daughter uh, was doing, you know, some homework and how all the history books referenced, you know, the natives as a past tense, you know, mm-hmm. what they used to be versus the fact that they still exist. They're still here. They're, they're yeah. still, this is, this yeah. is still a culture, but, yeah. you know, and, and I put into context and I started thinking about it. And I said, you know, you're right. <laughs> everything we do, yeah. every time we talk or everything we we do, we think about the old, you know, and maybe the old West is what's in our minds, you know, that imagery. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. how we put, we classified everybody as the black and white movie that we watched, you know, and, yeah. um, and I, how can we, how can we, you know, I know this is not maybe a funeral directing problem. Maybe it's a public health issue. Maybe that we yeah. come back to that. <laughs> maybe come back to our, our actual backgrounds here. But how do we, how can we help? How can we get that word out? And how can we help yeah. um, ensure that people know like this, they, they're still here. Yeah. <laughs> this is still a yeah. 
That is is very much an issue, particularly in the eastern region where, you know, colonization and contact happened in the 1600s versus out west, uh, where it was maybe more 1800. So there's been 200 more years of contact. Um, you know, we, we cite a stat in our training that 95% of the first 100 Google images when you search Native American come from uh, the 19th century come from the past. Uh, so that is is definitely an issue faced um, faced today. Uh, one other uh, to, to counter that, Native Americans are among the fastest growing population in the United States. Uh, between 2010 and the 2020 cent the 2010 and 2020 census, there was an astronomical uh, 85% increase in the population identifying as American Indian or Alaska Native. Um, there were a few differences in how the census was, how that data was collected in those two years. So it's not that that 85% number, some people kind of question, but just whatever the scale is, it's, it's very clear that it's a very growing population. Uh, and it's also growing, uh, maybe not in the areas, the states where you think in the training, we show a graph that shows the top 10 states where that growth occurred from 2010 to 2020. The number one state on that graph is Tennessee, where there are no federally recognized um, tribal tribal nation populations, but also rounding out that uh, top 15 uh, New Hampshire saw more than a double uh, increase uh, in their Native American population between 2010 and 2020, Vermont and Connecticut. And um, to answer your question about, you know, what we think, what you can do to, to help bring this awareness and recognition, um, I, I approach this work as a non-Native to try and be an ally uh, in all of the spaces that I enter. Um, so, you know, if I'm talking with people that aren't aware, um, being sure to, to bring up and to talk about these populations, of course, with the, the knowledge that I am not speaking for those individuals. I think supporting uh, Native artists, Native organizations, you talked about how your perspective is shaped by what is in the media. And if you look at the media representation of Native Americans, it is, it is, it is better, um, but it is not, not great. Um, there are, have been like in the last year, the, you know, the first, you know, Native led uh, production rooms and things like that, um, supporting Native artists, supporting um yeah, whatever way you can can learn about uh, this population from from Native American voices, I think is really important. Oh. Now, if our, you travel around for everything you do, all your seminars, and I know you're um, home based in Tennessee, right? Uh, our our office is in Tennessee. I'm okay. actually myself in Atlanta. You're in Atlanta. Okay. So now, if our listeners because you have a long presentation. I know you spent a whole night with us. Um, if they want to get in touch with you and they want to bring you to them uh, <laughs> and fly out, because I know you came to us on a grant, so this is a yes. great opportunity for them that, you know, low cost uh, opportunity to raise awareness and to get uh, a lot of information uh, from you and your colleagues. How can they go about that? Yeah, the best way to do it would be to reach out to me via email. Um, is there a way we could like attach my email to the podcast or you want me to say it or? You, you can say it and we'll absolutely put, we can put links and everything you want right onto our mortuarymayhem.com website okay, so that all the great. listeners will have access to that. Yeah, I will send you some resources that can go along with it. Um, you can email me at usetepi at usetinc.org. So that's U-S-E-T. E-P-I at U-S-E-T-I-N-C dot O-R-G. Um, we are very interested in doing these funeral director trainings. I think with the ones we did up in Massachusetts and Tennessee recently, we've now reached um, over 260 funeral directors, and we're hoping to continue to expand that. Um yeah, and we're just really excited and grateful every time we reach out to funeral service professionals. I personally have just always been blown away by how willing people are to work with us when they don't know who we are. Um, and I think we've uh, had a lot of really successful uh, trainings. Yeah, no, I mean, I know we we enjoyed it, and you know, definitely, I would encourage everyone, everyone listening, you know, <laughs> give Emma a, a a call or an email rather. Um, it really was your training was amazing. It was well worth it. Um, and uh, thank you so much. You know, I know it was yeah, and uh, definitely good for both students and for 
uh, practitioners. I mean, this is yeah. in, this is information that when you reached out to me uh, to come up, I mean, that was information. I was like, yeah, we're definitely jumping on this because this is something we don't have access to. This is something that, you know, this isn't in our textbooks. This is yeah. not something that we learn. Uh, so to bring you in was a, a va- very valuable resource uh, to yeah. be able to get that information out. And I hope everyone takes advantage of that. And I will say you don't know this, but when I was like looking for people to reach out and I saw you, I saw like on your profile that you had an MPH and I was like, oh, I bet he's going to respond. <laughs> Public health oh, definitely. people. <laughs> oh, that, I saw that in your signature as well. Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yep. Absolutely. No, it was definitely a pleasure having you. Um, and hopefully we'll have you back again too. And we yeah, can- we would love to come. Cool. Thank you so much for this too. Mark your calendars. The NFDA Arranger Training is coming to Bridgewater, Massachusetts on September 29, 2023. Check out the MortuaryMayhem.com website for more information. Thank you for listening to this episode of Mortuary Mayhem. For links to information discussed during this episode, please visit the website at www.MortuaryMayhem.com. Do you have questions, comments, Suggestions for topics or want to be a guest on the show? Email us at podcast at mortuarymayhem.com. We should do this again sometime.